Francis Crick and James Watson, with the help of Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin and other DNA researchers, discovered the DNA double helix while working at Cavendish Laboratory and Cambridge University. This discovery unlocked the basis of biology and revolutionized the direction and method of scientific research in the following decades, such as the launch of the Human Genome Project and the first gene therapy. What is DNA? DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is a nucleic acid that carries genes across all organisms. Genetic information is called genes, the building blocks of all organisms from humans to strawberries. DNA, RNA, and proteins are the three major macromolecules that are extremely important for all known organisms. Genes control the expression of proteins. The majority of human traits are controlled by many different genes. Multigenic inheritance. Multigenic traits include behavior, height, weight, intelligence, or anything within a large range of difference between people. Attached to two strands are four nucleobases, A, T, G, and C. They stand for adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. Those four letters are read using the genetic code, which specifies the amino acid sequences within the proteins. The genetic code is read by copying the stretches of DNA into the related nucleic acid RNA. This is called transcription. What about the double helix? The structure of the DNA double helix is made up of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and phosphorus. It has two polymers, or nucleotides, with backbones that are made up of sugars and phosphate, groups joined by ester bonds in opposite directions so that they are anti-parallel. Pieces of DNA are wrapped in proteins and coiled into chromosomes which reside in the cells of all organisms' bodies. There are 23 pairs of chromosomes in each cell. One set is inherited from each parent. Well, Francis, do you think we were lucky to have solved it? Or was it real brain work? Well, I guess we were certainly lucky. And, of course, you give the impression in your book, Jim, we didn't really do too much thinking. But uh, we were lucky, I think, for two reasons. We, we were thinking about the problem at the right time, and then the two of us, by collaborating, when one of us got on the wrong track, the other one could get us out of it. When if if um, I thought there were three, three chains at one stage, you were sure there were two. If uh, you thought that the um, phosphates had to be in the middle, then I would be the devil's advocate and say, put them on the outside. And I think this is very important in solving structures of this kind, because the difficulty is that you've got to get several logical steps one after the other if you get go wrong you get one person gets too fond of their own ideas i think another thing that which helped us in our collaboration was we weren't at least afraid of being very candid to each other to the point of being rude and if you don't have constant interchange and chatting together and saying what you think of the other people's ideas to their face i don't think you can solve problems of this kind. 3000 bc Ancient Chinese and Sumerian farmers selectively breed crops and animals as farming techniques. 1866. Gregory Mendel publishes his work on the heredity of peas. 1869. Frederick Major identifies DNA as an acidic substance in his cell nuclei after working with soiled bandages. 1900s. Hugo de Vries, Karl Korns, and Eric von Schermach independently confirm Mendel's work. In 1911, Thomas Hunt Morgan shows that genes are located linearly among chromosomes. 1943, William Astbury takes the first X-ray diffraction images of DNA. 1944, Oswald Avery shows that DNA is the transforming factor. 1948-49, Linus Pauling describes the shape of certain proteins as an alpha helix. 1950, Aaron Chargaff shows that there are equal amounts of nucleotides A and T and G and C, that there is an A for every T and a G for every C. 1952. Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase show that the viral DNA and not viral protein direct the replication of new viruses. The, this, the, other, the other strangeness is the underlying simplicity of much of the world, which is not a, apparent from the complexity we see. And this is basically because our, our brains ha, have evolved 
in terms of what our ancestors experienced on the one hand and what our own experience was, our brains have devolved so that they only look at a rather narrow part of what constitutes really the whole universe. They only look at a certain small range of sizes. They don't normally look, for example, at things you can only see in a microscope, let alone things which are much smaller. Uh, they don't look normally at things which are much bigger. I mean, most people have a pretty vague idea how far the moon was. They have distances which are really Earth distances. Well, when you look at, at, at the, the sizes we know from the very, very tiny things that you get in the interior of the, of the nucleus of the atom now, right up to the size of the universe, you realize we only see a small, very window of that. And the same with time. We, we have a time of experience which, again, we hardly appreciate anything which is shorter than a millisecond, a thousandth of a second. It's usually in seconds, minutes, days. Even, even a hundred years is not we can grasp. But a thousand years we have to be almost taught. But the le great length of time, for example, of the, of the age of the Earth, which is shorter, of course, than the age of the universe, four and a half billion years on the one hand, and the very, very, very short times which, which physicists deal with, with these ev events, uh, usually with very small matter and so on. Again, it's only a very small window of, 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 of time. In 1952, Maurice Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin took X-ray images of DNA crystals. In 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick described the three-dimensional structure of DNA as a double helix, two spiral link strands held together by complementary base pairs. Watson and Crick tried a physical approach, while Franklin and Wilkins tried an x-ray approach on it. In 1962, Crick, Watson, and Wilkins won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine. Franklin was not awarded the Nobel Prize since she had already died of ovary cancer and the Nobel Prize can only be given to three living recipients. Her cancer was a result of her exposure to x-rays. Jerome Legend determines that the Down syndrome results from an extra three copies of chromosome 21. 1966. Francis Crick and other scientists cracked the genetic code. 1968, Werner Arbor isolates restriction enzymes. 1972, Paul Berg employs restriction enzymes to cut and splice DNA, creating the first strand of recumbent DNA. 1977, Fred Sanger sequences DNA. 1982, the first genetically engineered drug is invented. 1983, James Gusella uses blood samples in Venezuela to identify the Huntington's disease marker. 1985, Carrie Mullis develops a sensitive method for amplifying DNA. 1986, the Human Genome Project is discussed. 1989, Francis Collins and Lap Chi Sui identify the crystal fibrosis gene. 1993, Huntington's disease is identified. 1996. Dolly the sheep is the first mammal to be cloned. 2000-2003. The final completion of the human genome sequence. There is a myth, of course, that goes round, you know, that Jim was the biologist and he did the biological part and I was the crystallographer and I did the crystallographic part. And that just won't stand up to critical examination because the business of the one-to-one -one thing, meaning replication, was the really thing I spotted with John Griffiths. But the way the bases went together, which is really pure crystallography, which you might have thought I was done, was done by Jim. And this is, I think, the importance of the collaboration. We sort of pooled the way we looked at things. We didn't leave it that Jim did the biology and I did the physics. We both did it together and switched roles and criticized each other. And this gave us a great advantage over the other, other people who were trying to solve it. Ah. Now, when you want to understand the world, you have to go, you have to go beyond those narrow limits, both in, up and down, both in space and time. And then you find that there's a uniformity and extraordinary things happening which you'd no idea of just looking at the world. And it's, this is the fascination of science, really, I think, to uncover so much which is not apparent just in everyday life.